Okay, now we come to Mary and the Magnificat, but in order to show you where Mary starts, I got to go back to Daniel. Don't worry that you can't read the Hebrew. Okay, just look at the numbers. This, hopefully you got the correction, is where Daniel had started with David. I was thinking, you know, when I did the video that it was 9-5, but it's 9-6, which is easily seen because the difference between 73, which is a date line, and 113 is 40, okay? Now... What I need to explain is I want you to see, look at the 49 that's above the calculator, okay? That's the 49th year of the captivity from the temple being down. 586 BC minus 49 is 537. It's the beginning of 537, end of 538, okay? The second, the 73 that's now below, above the calculator is a second date line. It's now cross-referencing Psalm 90. Psalm 90 ended with the beginning of the 1051st year to the birth of Messiah. Okay? That's what we would call the end of 1050 BC. Okay? Now, that is 73. He's using it a different way now. Times 7 is 511 years minus 1051 BC whoops I did it wrong okay 1051 I, I always screw this up okay let me do it again 73 times 7 is 511 years okay that minus where Moses leaves off, okay? So Moses left off at 1051 minus 538, be better. Okay, so it's 537, wait a minute, 1050, sorry. It's beginning and ending of year always gets me bollocks. I have the same problem in my job, 511. Okay, 539. There's a there's a beginning and ending of year problem there. Okay, but it, he means the same date. It's just that I'm not able to explain it as well because it's like 6 o'clock in the morning and I haven't gone to sleep yet. But it's the same date. He's picking up where Moses leaves off. Mary is going to take this 73 and it's going to pick up where Daniel leaves off. Well, where does Daniel really leave off? Well, that's where we have to come to this very convoluted chart here. Let's see if I can get it all on one page. I hope you can see this. Okay. See if you can look at the bottom. I'm, I'm going to have to increase it to 125, I think. All right. It's not going to show the whole page. I'm sorry. I wonder if I got rid of... Um, can I hide this stupid... Hide the toolbars? Yeah, okay, good. That get, lets me show it better. Okay, right down here in the lower right-hand corner. You see this? Daniel's going, like I said, he's going future. All right? He's going future on multiple accounting tracks. One of the ways he's doing it is that he's indexing time. Actually, three tracks all together. He's indexing time to Isaiah, that's Isaiah right there, syllable 133 in Isaiah. He's tracking that in Isaiah that references Manasseh. Manasseh is the cause of Temple Down. He's tying the juridical to the actual timeline. At the same syllable, he's also tracking to Solomon through Asa's 11th year. It's very sophisticated here, okay. By doing this dual mode accounting, he's taking the, the man of time, which is the, you know, the ten toes and the iron mixed. That's the rise of Rome. Okay? That's the Rome came to its rise during the Punic Wars. Okay? So Daniel stops his accounting at 238 BC with the rise of Rome. He's gotten to the feet of the man of time. And that's where he stops in his annual 
chronology on two different time tracks. Keep that number 238 BC in mind because now we're going to go to Mary. Okay. I'm sorry this is so complicated. Okay. Now we come up to Mary. You know, there. Okay. Now we come up to Mary. Remember, we stopped at Daniel at 238. 238 minus the same 73, when she's using just flat years, is Hanukkah. Okay? Again, you've got a year rounding difference beginning and ending of year. You always have that with the Bible accounting. And I've got to hone it down as to which is beginning and which is end. But that's what's meant, is Hanukkah. So Mary's chronology, this is her Magnificat. Here's the translation it, it, using the exact same meter but in English. So it would be easier for you to tell. See, these are the same, I'm using the same syllable counts as the Greek, except I translated it into English. Okay? So it's the exact same syllable count as you'll see here for the Greek. Okay, these little red things are ellipsis, where you pronounce that as one syllable. So it would be kaipen miriam. I did a whole playlist on the Magnificat. It's 12 videos. Just look at the Magnificat playlist to go through all the details. I'm not going to go through all the details here. Okay, because obviously I'm not, you know, you'll fall asleep. Okay, just know that I translated the exact same syllable counts in the Greek into English, okay? And then I, you know, I, I made it look the poem that it is by, you know, using one line like this. And then these colors, this is a whole paragraph, all right? This is a whole paragraph that's by color. So it's one paragraph in yellow, then there's a little hiatus, okay? And then there's another paragraph in blue, and then another paragraph in yellow, alternating, so that you could get the sense of what she's saying in the Greek, but using English. Okay, now just like everybody else, and she's saying this on the fly, which means these people were taught how to do this when they were kids. She's starting 73 years after Daniel leaves off in his time poem, to start at Hanukkah because her son is going to be born on Hanukkah because when she's visiting Elizabeth it's the sixth month of the calendar which Luke tells you in Greek using double definite articles which is how official dates in the Old Testament in Greek were used when they used official dates on the calendar they used two definite articles when it was relative to just somebody they used only one the sixth month in Luke 126 is talking about the sixth month on the calendar, not the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. It is the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, but you don't know that until Luke 136, where Gabriel says, you know, it's the sixth month of her pregnancy. Gabriel does not have to tell Mary that she's in the month of Adar. He's making a pun on the fact that she's in Adar and Elizabeth is also in her sixth month. Okay, which means Elizabeth got pregnant in Elul just after the, you know, the anniversary of the completion of um, the walls. Okay, which is in Ezra 6.15. Alright. Nehemiah 6.15. I'm sorry. Okay, so... Hanukkah is when Christ is going to be born because nine months from Adar is Kislev and it'll be Hanukkah at that point. Okay, that's the gestation period, 25th, Hanukkah, second Independence Day for Israel, Feast of Lights, the light of the world is born on that day. See, that's why light is made so much of in the book of Luke. That's why the, the star, which isn't a star but an angel, is not in Bethlehem but suddenly disappears when it should have been over Jerusalem because that's why those Magi are there looking for the star they can't see it anymore and neither can anybody in Jerusalem which is why the Magi are there saying oh well where's where's the king because they can't see the star 
Why? Because it's an angel and because Luke, because Mary and Joseph are in Jerusalem because 40 days postpartum she has to present herself at temple. Eight days postpartum her son has to be circumcised. They're at the temple registering Christ who's just been born. Okay, they aren't in Bethlehem. They're in Jerusalem. Okay, and the angel is not going to be visible in Jerusalem because he's protecting them. Hello. Angel, stars don't hover over houses. And it's not until they go back home to Nazareth, which is at the end of Matthew 1, that the angel, that the star is seen again. Yeah, and it's seen at Nazareth. And you know what? Herod was following the Magi. And you know what? Joseph has to leave the same night that the Magi arrive, which was what? 40 days after Hanukkah. You see the meter? You see the joke? Again, if I say the stockings were hung by the Christmas with by the chimney with care, I don't need to say it's Christmas. If there's all these lights and angels, you don't need to say it's Hanukkah, because that's what Hanukkah was about. Of course, you know, Paul Flat tells you it was the Saturnalia festival in Galatians 4 4. He's making word play also. But if you don't know the Greek, well then you don't know that. Okay? So this is what Mary's doing. Okay, so she has her own time poem. She starts back at the initial Hanukkah, 73 years after Daniel leaves off. Okay, 16 years later, that's 1 Maccabees 10.1. Okay, now what happened with the Maccabees is they usurped the kingship and the priesthood away from the rightful house of Judah, away from the rightful house of Aaron. That's what they did. The Maccabees were bad. They started out good, they went bad. And it's here that that badness occurs with Demetrius, who was the Seleucid guy. Okay, the, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, they make a deal. The Maccabees make a deal to, to trade it off, and that's how they usurp the kingship. So she's picking up from there. Okay, in other words, she's saying that the reason for Hanukkah to, to happen in the first place is because these guys were playing footsie with the Greeks, the Seleucids in the north, and the Ptolemies in Egypt. Okay, that's called the War of the, the Diadochi, which happened after Alexander died. So the guy who was the most prominent to do this, and he started the, the dynasty, and, and Herod will come from him is Hyrcanus and I, these are the Bible verses being listed she's metering to that okay now she meters here and the thing that's real important about this um, these later numbers here are if Luke is tracking to another timeline but I haven't worked that out yet if Luke is really doing that because there's an extra four syllables here at this fronting clause Mary's actual time poem begins here. So look at the right-hand side numbers for Mary's own meter. And here, it's first divisible by 7. That's her date line. She's saying she's 35 when this happens. She's also saying that it's 5 BC. And she's also saying that our friend Herod had been in power since 40 BC. I mean, yeah. Well, yeah, since 40 BC. But she's saying she's 35. She's a royal person. She should be dating time in light of years from a king, years from a queen. She's entitled to be a queen. She should date in light of herself. That's the first date line. And, you know, so she's dating in light of herself and in light of a king who's in power, namely Herod, all at the same time. That also dates back to 129 BC when Antiochus the seventh freed Israel. The, the defeat of Antiochus the seventh by Hyrcanus freed Israel. Okay, and then she's mapping it again. 42, this is relating to 42 BC. I go through all this in the videos. I don't want to spend too much time on it. This is the rise of Mary. She is benchmarking the historical events that gave rise to Israel being free and her son being born. That's what she's doing. And I go through that in detail in the Mary Magnificat playlist. 
Okay, then she's sevening again to the rise of to Marius being disgraced. It's because of Marius that Rome really rose to power because it's Marius who's the guy who um, allowed the plebes in the military. And that's what made Rome finally be, become great. Because until then, plebes weren't allowed in the military. It was only the nobility. And that was decimating the, mo the, the nobility. So Rome was actually losing power instead of gaining power. Okay, so it's because Marius allowed plebes in the military that, that Roman power finally was able to grow. And Marius and Sulla were constantly at war with each other. They were That was a sort of Roman civil war that was going on. They called it the social war. And she's benchmarking these very significant events that gave rise to Israel's being able to be free. Sulla retires here, she's benchmarking that. Then Pompey comes into power. Then Pompey comes in the Middle East, and that's what fosters the change for Israel. Okay? And then in 59, Caesar's elected consul, and when she highlights that, the text, and I explain this in the other videos in the Magnificat playlist, I show you how the text is actually referencing in Rye wordplay the rise of Caesar being elected consul. And I don't have time to go through all that here. I just want to show you that it's happening. Then she's been smarking, sees crossing the Rubicon, then Herod becoming Tetrarch, and here she's going full circle back to her own age and her own birth, okay, to this first 35 up here. See, Daniel went full circle, and so does she. And then, of course, you know, she's benchmarking the next significant event that gave rise to Israel's future, the Battle of Actium, which is where Octavian, a.k.a. Augustus, became solely in power. And then the rebuilding of the temple became possible because of the Parthian Treaty in 21 B.C. with Augustus. And then, of course, in 14 B.C., Tiberius was promoted, and that would have a major impact on Israel's history. And, of course, this is what we have to call 4 B.C. Christ born at Hanukkah. Okay? And this is now, you know, nine months future to her. But she goes past that. So now, like Daniel, she's going into the future. In the 160th anniversary of Hanukkah, Christ will be born. And again, like I said, I go through this in much more detail in the Magnificat playlist. Okay, then she benchmarks to his future events in his life when he's age 12. We learn about that in Luke when he's, you know, they, she and Joseph sort of have a brain fart. They forget their own kid. And for three days, they're halfway home. And then they realize that he's not in their caravan. So they have to double back and he's in the temple. And that's where they find him. And he says to them, didn't you know I'd be in my father's house? So she benchmarks that in the future. It's really interesting. I mean, she had to laugh when the event actually occurred because I'm sure she didn't intend for it to happen. And then this is when he becomes an adult. All right? This is when he's gonna getting ready to announce himself as king. And this is the time he was scheduled to die. Again, that ties back to Daniel 9.26. It's the same timeline. All right? And here she's doing, like, estimating what how how it, it's as if she knows that something's going to go wrong i haven't worked all this out yet paul's playing on what she does here she's basically saying okay well by 48 by what we would call 48 a.d abraham's time was that 54 year credit she's trying to figure out well okay if it's as if she kind of knows he's going to die here because now she's saying, well, okay, 24 years later, um, there would be so many years left to the millennium if, if the temple destruction started happening here or the time of the Gentiles. Would this be a payback on Abraham's time? And then definitely by this point, okay, it would pay back on Abraham's time. Now, see, the point here is that's 53 A.D. by our terms because we have that three-year overlap. All right, see? Measured from here, he would be age 56 in his 57th year. And that's what she's calculating as she talks off the top of her head. Just got off her donkey to visit Elizabeth, and this is how she reacts 
either Elizabeth telling her the news and she didn't know, or she does know but didn't know Elizabeth knew, and maybe she was composing this idea as she was traveling to Elizabeth. I don't know. But the thing is, is that she's composing this in her mouth, orally, on the fly. So these guys were taught this meter. They were taught this as kids. Because when Paul does it, he's also sitting between two praetorians. Well, not, he's in prison talking to an amanuensis, either in Jerusalem still at the time he says Ephesians, or he's, he's already in Rome talking between two praetorian guards to an amanuensis, dictating off the top of his head the meter. She's doing the same thing here. I'm totally blown away by this. Okay, I mean, there must be thousands of passages that have the same kind of pattern in it. I won't live long enough to find them all. But that's what she's doing, picking up 73 years after Daniel, going all the way down to when Christ would be age 56, figuring out the time period that plays back and pays back for the 54 years that Abraham matured early so that the Gentiles get repaid. And that's where Paul picks up, and that's where we'll pick up in the next increment.